Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar briefing of the National Academies report, Health Considerations for Use of Unencapsulated Steel Slag. My name is Ray Wassel, and I was the, the National Academies responsible staff officer during the study that resulted in this report. Thomasina, can I have the first slide, please? Today's briefing will have two parts. Dr. Aaron Barchowski, who served as chair of the authoring committee, will provide an overview of the report. After that, Dr. Barchowski will be joined by other committee members and answering questions submitted by those who are live streaming the session. Next slide, please. The committee's report was released uh, back in November and can be downloaded for free from the National Academies Press website. Next slide. Uh, just a few words about the organization that the committee operated under. The National Academies is an overall term for the National Academy of Sciences, Academy of Engineering, Academy of Medicine. These three organizations work together to provide advice to the, to the nation. All three are private nonprofit organizations. And since they are not part of the government, they do not provide any legal requirements or federal policies. Next slide. When a government agency such as EPA requests a study to help address a complex problem, a National Academies Committee is formed of people having relevant expertise and experience to carry out a written task. The committee members agree to serve as unpaid volunteers and work within the Academy's study process. The process is set up so that committee members gather information in sessions that are open to the public. However, they do their analysis and write their report in private meetings without the involvement of government officials or other stakeholders. After the committee's report is successfully goes through a rigorous review process, it is only then that it's submitted to the sponsoring agency and released to the public. Next slide. Here's a list of members of the committee members who uh, wrote the report to be discussed today. I'd like each of them uh, who are attending today's webinar to briefly introduce themselves. We'll start with the chair. Uh, hello, I'm Aaron Barchowski. I am a professor in environmental and occupational health at the University of Pittsburgh, and I have expertise in uh, mechanisms of metals toxicology. Dr. Asher? I'm uh, Michael Ashner. I'm in the Department of Molecular Pharmacology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, where I'm a professor and my interest is in the neurotoxicity of metals. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dan Bain. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Geology and Environmental Science at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, research interests in the uh, environmental behavior of trace metals. I don't know if Alan Cram has joined us at this time. Okay. Um, Phil Goodrum, can you introduce yourself? Phil is on the phone. Hi, my name is Phil Goodrum. I am a principal toxicologist with GSI Environmental. And my area of expertise is uh, metals toxicology and environmental risk assessment. John Kissel. Uh, I'm John Kissel. I'm Professor Emeritus of Environmental and Occupational Health Scientists, Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. And I am a human exposure scientist. Deb Niemeyer. I am Deb Niemeyer. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland. And my 
in uh, civil and environmental engineering, and I work on equity and justice issues in the built environment. Peggy O'Day. Hello, I'm Peggy O'Day. I'm a professor in the Department of Life and Environmental Sciences at the University of California, Merced, and I study environmental geochemistry, primarily of heavy metals. Oh. Hi, my name is Ruth O'Donnell. Uh, from 2013 to 2020, I worked for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources in the Bureau of Waste Management, and I was part of the beneficial use of industrial byproducts team. Walker. Hi, I'm Dave Walker. I'm Professor Emeritus of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. I specialized in mineralogy. My research career was largely devoted to understanding the phase equilibrium and thermochemistry of crystallizing silicate and oxide liquids. Robert Wright. Hello, I'm Bob Wright. I'm a pediatrician, medical toxicologist, and epidemiologist at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and a uh, majority of my research has been in metal toxicity in children. Thank you. Are there any other committee members who did not get a chance to introduce themselves? Okay. Hi, Hi there, I'm on. Oh. It's Rebecca, Rebecca Fry. I'm at oh, the univers Hi. University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, in environmental sciences and engineering. Thanks so much. Okay, very good. Does that round it out? Okay, uh, next slide, please. And uh, this slide uh, gives the names of the of folks on our staff who uh, supported the work of the committee. I won't ask them to introduce themselves. I just wanted to show their names. Now, um, before I ask Dr. Barchowski to provide an overview of the report, I want to mention that a video recording is being made of this webinar and an internet link to access the recording will be available on the event page for this webinar by as early as tomorrow. And then if anyone live streaming this session would like to submit a question to the committee, Please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then after um, uh, Dr. Barchowski is finished with the uh, presentation, then we'll get to the questions. Thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Barchowski. Okay, ne next slide, please. Okay, um, hello and... Um, just to start off, uh, let's all get on the same page and uh, get a good understanding for what we're discussing. Uh, and um, what is slag, uh, and especially electric arc furnace um, slag. So electric arc, electric arc furnaces um, <laughs> produce uh, slag. Um, the steel uh, basically can pro be produced from iron ore or uh, steel scrap. Um, using several processes. The electric arc furnace uh, are used uh, to produce about 75% of the steel made in the United States. Uh, the rest remain are uh, blast furnaces. Um, in this process, an electric current is used to melt scrap steel or other iron containing materials. And as a result uh, of this process, uh, a layer of molten slag is formed uh, that floats on top of the liquid metal uh, and can contain toxic metals at various concentrations. Slag composition, intended function, and the quantity formed really depend on which type of steel is being produced and the various chemicals uh, added uh, in the process. After the slag layer is removed from the furnace, it's cooled uh, and solidifies into a very hard rock-like uh, material. And uh, this can be crushed into different sizes 
uh, for various applications. Often, uh, instead of using uh, quarried rock uh, fragments. Next slide, please. As seen in this slide, um, there uh, <clears throat> the shows to slag. There are really two main uh, uses of the slag, or two types of the slag uses. Uh, first would be encapsulated or bound uses. And here we're using these aggregates of the uh, <clears throat> um, in uh, concrete uh, or encapsulated in asphalt for roadbeds. Uh, the unencapsulated, unbound uh, form uh, is, is used in um, applications such as uh, loose ground cover for landscaping, um, driveway uh, beds, uh, parking lots, uh, and uh, railroad beds. Next slide, please. So we do have some concerns, um, and those concerns come from uh, the fact that the electric arc furnace uh, slag uh, can contain toxic metals uh, at elevated levels. Uh, US EPA said it is unclear whether uh, unencapsulated uh, EAF slag um, use near residents and schools causes a risk. They, they do have some concerns, uh, and one of their remedies was to recommend various steps residents can take to minimize contact with the uh, slag dust uh, and small particles in the slag. In addition, EPA has undertaken uh, research uh, to address key concerns uh, and uncertainties. And as a part of its overall research efforts, EPA asked uh, the National Academies to independently assess potential human health risks from the use of unencapsulated uh, electric arc furnace uh, slag in residential areas. Next slide. So using um, the uh, available information analyses, the committee uh, was asked to assess human health risks associated with using uh, the unencapsulated uh, electric arc furnace slag. And uh, we were asked uh, to, uh, to include a number of uh, considerations, uh, those being where and how, the, how much electric arc furnace slag is used in the United States, uh, effects of weathering on the chemical and physical properties of applied, applied slag over time, ways in which humans can be exposed to toxic chemicals in slag and how those exposures compare with exposures associated with incidences of cancer uh, and other adverse effects uh, in other kinds of environmental studies. We're also concerned with factors that may lead to the highest health risk from slag exposures. And this would include uh, looking at uh, life stage of those exposed, for example, um, children, elderly, et cetera, socioeconomic uh, living conditions uh, that may lead uh, to increased susceptibility uh, to adverse effects. Uh, research recommendations uh, were also asked for addressing uh, important uh, information gaps. So where don't we have enough information? Next slide, please. The committee uh, heard presentations and received written materials from EPA, the National Slag Association, an industry group, and its consultants, uh, and other researchers, including studies of slag composition, leaching of toxic metals from the slag, and risks expected under possible exposure scenarios. In considering the potential adverse uh, health effects associated with exposures to the kinds of toxic metals contained in slag, the committee mainly considered manganese and hexavalent chromium as lead metals that, of concern. Uh, this focus uh, was basically requested uh, by the EPA, uh, and it, <laughs> they are potentially the um, highest risks that might be found. Manganese has posed um, uh, high potential for concern in various uh, slag assessments. Um, it's a neurotoxicant. Hexavalent chromium 
uh, is a psi constituent for which exposure is associated with a theoretical excess cancer risk and has also been found in as a slag uh, constituent. Because general data limitations, uh, the committee did not attempt to develop an overall characterization of the health uh, risk. We, we were not really charged with coming up with a full risk assessment uh, from the unencapsulated slag use. We um, did uh, provide insights and identified key data needs for um, a better understanding of this risk uh, at the national level. Next slide, please. So the importance is the national level and the committee identified 117 different uh, EAF uh, steel plants in 33 states, so a wide distribution. Associated with these are 91 uh, slag processing facilities uh, that are serviced uh, very locally. Uh, the amount of slag produced annually is about 10 to 15 percent of the amount of steel produced at these uh, EAF plants, uh, and that was roughly about uh, 6.3 million tons of slag um, that were sold in uh, 2022. The uh, slag is really heavy and generally it's only distributed locally. Um, so uh, it's generally transported to projects uh, in close proximity to uh, those processing uh, plants and, and primarily by truck. Uh, and quantitative information on how and where unencapsulated uh, slag um, is used is actually limited. The majority of steel furnace slag use uh, appears to be road bases and surfaces, and this would include railroad uh, track uh, <coughs> uh, uh, beds. Um, and, However, you know, the annual amount of slag used for residential applications at the national level is really uh, not tracked and is somewhat unknown. Next slide, please. So composition, um, the slag composition varies a great deal according to the grade of steel produced, the source of scrap uh, that's used as feed for the, for the steel, uh, and also uh, the um, operational practices. So this can vary quite a bit across those different uh, facilities. The slag is rich in compounds containing iron, manganese, calcium, silicon, uh, and aluminum. And a majority of, of what's produced is stainless steel and the stainless steel uh, uh, EAF slags contain high levels of chromium. Other chemicals can be present at low concentrations, and these can be um, metals such as nickel, cadmium, lead, zinc, vanadium, titanium, molybdenum, uh, tin, arsenic, antimony, and barium. Slag concentrations of manganese, chromium, vanadium, and in a few cases, uh, arsenic can be greater than the levels uh, EPA sets for considerations of uh, those metals in soils for um, site remediation planning. Of a, also a potential concern um, are several polyaromatic hydrocarbons um, and that have been detected. Uh, in, in production uh, at relatively low concentrations compared uh, to EPA soil screening levels. But the PAHs uh, are in general a class of chemicals referred to as persistent organic pollutants uh, that are toxic uh, chemicals, uh, which take a long time to break down the environment. But again, uh, assessment of the risk from these uh, in slag has not really been adequately uh, uh, approached. Next slide, please. Of major concern is the size of uh, particles that could be uh, uh, affecting um, uh, human um, exposures. 
And exposure to the small particles are of most concern um, with um, assessment of risk uh, being um, uh, limited uh, in using the unencapsulated slag. The small particles uh, can be more chemically reactive because they have a larger surface area. Uh, and um, they also can be uh, more deeply inhaled into a person's um, uh, airways. Uh, generally, um, what we're concerned with are particles that are uh, maybe a hundredth or a thousand uh, times smaller than a grain of sand. Much of the physical uh, testing of slag has been done uh, on its uh, resistance to breakdown uh, in various encapsulated mixes, uh, such as uh, asphalt, uh, rather than its unencapsulated uses. A approaches for testing the strength of the unencapsulated slag fragments vary widely, uh, and they focused on how much of the slag remains intact rather than on the amount of small particles worn off. Because of those the data limitations, the committee could not draw general conclusions about the amounts and properties of smaller particles generated over time uh, from the wearing down of the unencapsulated slag. Next slide, please. In addition to the particles, there's concern about leaching of the toxic metals from the slag, uh, and that has been examined, uh, mostly using standardized testing in a laboratory, not out in the environment. Short-term testing generally is focused, uh, is found that the minimal, minimal leaching of toxic chemicals uh, or metals uh, from the AF occurs, and concentrations of the leached metals are not detectable or below regulatory limits. In general, studies uh, to date have not examined the long-term fate of slag chemicals um, released under variable environmental conditions. The most commonly reported result from weathering and leaching of slags is um, that in highly alkaline or, or basic leached water uh, flowing from uh, surface in, into surface water from the groundwater. So again, a very high level of, of base. Few studies have shown that alkaline water occurring in, in near old slag piles is neutralized rapidly uh, and uh, migration offsite, offsite is limited. However, generation um, migration and neutralization of alkaline water from slag weathering has not been extensively studied uh, in the unencapsulated applications, such as uh, in landscaping. Next slide, please. So this slide uh, has a nice scheme, um, and it's an example of a generic model for how humans would be exposed uh, to slag constituents in a residential setting. Uh, assessment of human exposure to chemicals involves consideration of concentration of chemicals in food, air, water, soil, or on surfaces that come in contact with individuals. Uh, example would be dust coming into homes. Um, and exposure pathways are the pathways the chemicals take from the source uh, to the exposed person. So source being EAF slag, and then exposure route uh, being that last column. Exposure routes refer to how metals uh, or chemicals enter the body. This slide shows a generic model uh, that may apply to sites where EAF slag is used in an unencapsulated manner uh, in a residential setting, such as uh, for driveway cover or yard landscaping. It is important to note that the actual model uh, at each site will depend on numerous factors. And those include the amount and type of slag used, human activity patterns around the slag use, and local soil and climate conditions. 
Next slide, please. Exposure considerations, uh, <clears throat> such as those climate conditions, potentially important exposure pathways in routes include incidental ingestion of slag particles mixed in outdoor soil and indoor dust, inhalation and dermal contact. <clears throat> also, um, exposure pathways for consideration include ingestion of home-produced foods grown uh, on properties with uh, electric arc furnace slag uh, being applied, and ingestion and dermal contact with surface waters uh, and groundwater receiving metals leached from uh, slag. When mixed with outdoor soil uh, and indoor dust, EAS slag uh, may alter the overall human uptake and absorption of slag chemicals of concern. Therefore, use of site-specific data would be prefer preferable uh, to using estimates from literature, laboratory experiments when making uh, exposure uh, calculations. Next slide. As I mentioned, we mainly focused on uh, toxicity of chromium and manganese uh, as uh, potential metals of concern uh, in the slag. Uh, there are many other metals, but uh, this focus uh, was because we just wanted to look at the major leaders uh, the, of concern. Uh, and uh, there may be uh, additional looks at some of the toxicities in the future. But with chromium, the major concern is uh, cancer. Uh, and the um, and it's really only the hexavalent form of uh, chromium that poses a hazard. Um, that may be a bit complicated to understand, but uh, hexavalent chromium is basically chromic acid, whereas a chromium uh, three uh, or trivalent chromium is actually thought of as a nutrient uh, a, a, a nutrient supplement and not a hazard. Few studies have really addressed the extent of formation of hexavalent chrom chromium in slag directly, but the available data suggests that the amount under ambient weathering conditions is relatively low. The absorption of chromium is greatly limited by um, our body's uh, protective ability to reduce the hexavalent chromium to trivalent chromium in the fluids that line the gastrointestinal tract uh, and the lung airways. And it's not clear whether there's sufficient accessible hexavalent chromium that's coming from the slag or slag dust to overwhelm uh, this reductive capacity. Based on limited uh, data, um, it may be that pregnant women, young children, elderly individuals, and individuals with particularly genetic uh, susceptibilities might be more likely to be vulnerable to the, this uh, effect of hexavalent chromium uh, from the slag. The hexavalent chromium exposure uh, might exacerbate health conditions in individuals with pre-existing uh, pathologies or disease burdens, uh, in the GI tract, uh, liver, lungs, and blood. But unfortunately, there are, is really a lack of in epidemiological studies of environmental exposures to hexavalent chromium compared to occupational exposures. Uh, and so uh, because of this, um, the data is insufficient to exclude the risk of non-cancer disease endpoints uh, in susceptible populations. Manganese, uh, as I mentioned, also poses a, uh, a major toxicity. The primary toxicity with manganese uh, is uh, <clears throat> that it's a neurological uh, toxicant uh, with some evidence uh, for other uh, health effects such as uh, liver toxicity. Again, uh, pregnant women, Early childhood individuals, um, especially uh, considering the manganese effects on developmental uh, uh, neurological uh, and 
cognitive cognition and endpoints, uh, and elderly individuals would likely be more vulnerable to uh, manganese uh, <laughs> exposure from the slag. Those with chronic neurological diseases, such as autism, Alzheimer's disease, and pre-existing liver disease can also uh, be at risk, increased risk um, uh, in their vulnerability to manganese exposures. The um, exposures during pregnancy and in early childhood um, have been associated with lower neuro uh, develop, developmental uh, test scores, uh, tests and motor function, uh, and depressive symptoms, amongst other effects. However, in general, the majority of studies uh, are in adults uh, and also um, mostly occupational exposures, making direct comparisons with children's uh, studies complicated, and there really is a large need for more environmental exposure studies. Next slide, please. Continuing uh, the uh, theme of increased susceptibility, uh, especially in overburdened communities, uh, the committee assessed um, whether uh, people um, are exposed to numerous uh, different um, chemical pollutants uh, and other stressors from a wide array of sources over their lifespans. Uh, disadvantaged communities have a higher burden of uh, cumulative exposures to, to multiple stressors, including chemical stressors, such as the environmental pollutants that might come from uh, slag uh, and non-chemical factors such as diet, healthcare uh, access, policies leading to residential segregation and socioeconomics. Exposure to chemical stressors such as chromium and manganese uh, can result uh, from various sources uh, in addition to slag in dis disadvantaged communities uh, and other uh, stressors uh, such as lead, and non-chemical stressors can exacerbate health effects associated with chromium and manganese. The <clears throat> committee examined um, two areas, uh, one in Allegheny County, uh, PA, uh, and Pueblo, Colorado, as cases, um, case examples to illustrate disadvantaged communities um, in uh, reasonable uh, proximity to slag processing facilities uh, and it might have access to the unencapsulated slag use. Um, cumulative exposures that are disproportionately borne uh, by disadvantaged and, and overburdened individuals and communities can exacerbate health risks of EAF slag chemicals, including the risk of negative cognitive effects. Next slide, please. So the, um, with previous risk assessments of uh, EAF uh, slag use, uh, the committee uh, considered five past risk assessments. There's a, actually a large, long history of this, but one main one uh, was with the Wisconsin Department of uh, Health Sciences that focused on slag from a very specific EAF uh, steel plant. Four others uh, were funded by the slag, Steel Slag Coalition or the National Slag Association. Again, industry groups uh, considered uh, slag uh, from um, multiple facilities. The concepts and approaches applied in assessments tended to represent rather narrowly defined uh, conditions which are likely not reasonable for extrapolating to the national level. For example, exposure scenarios in which slag covers only the driveway of a residence rather than a large portion of a property, such as an industrial uh, <clears throat> plant where you have a large parking lot, um, just surface area. Ranking chemicals, uh, next slide please. So, Again, uh, a future consideration, uh, there's a need to rank uh, chemicals in the slag. Um, 
and to illustrate a method for identifying slag chemicals that warrant further consideration as potential risk contributors. The committee applied a hazard ranking approach uh, in which data on slag composition uh, <clears throat> were compared with EPA's regional screening levels uh, for res residential uh, exposures uh, to soil. Next slide, please. We also uh, <clears throat> did a hazard ranking uh, of the slag uh, metals. Uh, and uh, this graph shows that the highest ranking is for manganese, Iron, hexavalent chromium, vanadium, uh, and thallium, and, and antimony are also among uh, the higher ranked chemicals. Next slide, please. And so, in identifying risks, uh, the committee identified factors considering uh, to have the potential to contribute to the highest risk from the use of unencapsulated EAS slag. The relative importance of these factors is expected to differ um, in a case-by-case -case basis. And again, this is primarily because all those different um, <coughs> uh, EAF facilities are taking in different sources of scrap, et cetera, so there'll be different composition. The relative importance of these factors is expected to differ uh, <laughs> in, in different locations. The factors uh, also uh, comprise key data needs. A greater understanding of these factors will ensure that the calculated slag-related risks are not overestimated or underestimated. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> this gets to be very complicated and uh, elaborate, but um, we did identify key risk factors and data needs. So a number of bullets, but uh, to go through them, uh, the amount of slag used for residential application. The focus on this report is on residential applications of EAF slag. However, currently available information does not allow for characterization of the amount of EAF uh, slag used nationally for uh, that kind of application. In the case of flag particle size distribution, the small size particles uh, are <coughs> uh, that can be transported in air uh, and stick to clothing um, and be tracked into the home and deposit into various outdoor and indoor surfaces um, are important. Uh, the concentration of some chemicals uh, of potential concern uh, can increase uh, as particle size decreases. Uh, and the particle size distributions uh, for fresh and weathered slag are very poorly characterized. Particle exposures, uh, including indoor residential. Um, children can ingest slag particles while playing on uh, the ground outdoors or on the floor indoors from dust. Adults may also ingest uh, slag particles that adhere to food or their uh, hands. Inhalation exposures may occur depending on the particle size distribution of slag and the extent of areas where the slag is applied. Specific residential uses that may result in exposures, particularly to susceptible groups, um, <clears throat> uh, is, and, and more broadly, um, it is a really a key data gap. Nearness of humans to applied slag and, and the frequency of human contact. Exposure factors and exposure routes, such as those related to uh, the extent of slag coverage of a residential property can substantially affect uh, the result of a risk um, calculation. And the exposure time factors associated with uh, health outcomes of interest are another important consideration. For example, cancer outcomes are typically associated with longer periods of exposure uh, than for non-cancer outcomes. Chemical uh, and physical weathering, again, a, a key factor that needs to be looked at. 
uh, many environmental factors uh, uh, such as climate uh, conditions uh, and factors <laughs> directly related to slag influence, uh, the rate at which chemicals of potential concern are mobilized uh, from unencapsulated slag, how concentrations of slag uh, constituents change over time is an important uh, uncertainty. The pH of the water or the alkaline uh, water conditions uh, from weathered slag, weathering and leaching of EAS slag can result in high alkaline water, uh, degrading the quality of surface water and groundwater. More information is needed about those effects and the long-term fate of potentially hazardous slag metals released into the environment under different uh, climate conditions. Exposure to manganese, exposure to high concentrations exhibits uh, neuro neurological toxicity with some evidence of other health effects such as uh, liver toxicity. However, comprehensive reevaluation of the toxicological and epidemiological literature for manganese is needed, especially with environmental exposures. Exposure to hexavalent chromium, estimates of cancer risk from chromium uh, in slag are highly sensitive to estimates regarding the chemical form of the chromium present in the slag and to changes in that, in that uh, may occur over uh, time. Um, <clears throat> few studies have directly assessed the extent of formation of hexavalent chromium in applied uh, slag and how much of the amounts of, of people are exposed uh, to uh, gets absorbed uh, into a person's body. Exposure to other uh, high hazard chemicals, um, a number of chemicals other than manganese and hexavalent chromium uh, can occur within uh, EAF slag uh, at concentrations of interest, especially antimony, uh, arsenic, iron, uh, thallium, and vanadium. Also, it needs to be determined whether analysis for persistent organic pollutants uh, should be included in future testing of uh, EAS slag risk. Susceptible life stages, um, we need to be cognizant of different life stages where uh, there is increased susceptibility, such as uh, pregnancy, early uh, life exposures, uh, and uh, exposures during development, such in childhood and adolescence, and in old age where uh, our uh, defenses are diminished. Elevated manganese exposure during pregnancy and early childhood have been associated with lower uh, neuro neurodevelopmental uh, test scores, but again, the epidemiology is really not there for understanding uh, risks from uh, the uh, slag. Cumulative exposures in overburdened uh, communities is a major concern. Uh, and inequitable uh, cumulative exposures to people in communities uh, can exacerbate health risk associated with exposures uh, to slag components. And this is also of major concern since there are many other uh, co-exposures uh, in these communities that may increase susceptibility. Next slide, please. So in concluding remarks, um, the committee considered screening level analysis of residential uh, use scenarios of slag that indicated an exceedance of established risk thresholds and assessment of other scenarios reported risk uh, below those thresholds. Due to uncertainties in the current evidence stream, the committee was unable to make an overall characterization of health risk related to the unencapsulated use of EAS slag uh, in the US. And until more environmental uh, studies uh, have been uh, conducted and characterized a wider range of whether EAS slag material and environmental conditions, uh, the committee cautions against making generalizations uh, from uh, conclusions from uh, the public uh, risk published risk assessments. 
a greater understanding of the risk factors and data needs uh, uh, identified by the committee will help ensure that uh, calculated slag related risks are not overestimated or underestimated. And with that, I believe I'll be glad to answer any questions or the committee uh, can answer any questions. And uh, please uh, put your questions in the chat. Oh, there is one question that came in and maybe uh, Phil could answer it. Could, do you want to read it? Uh, I'm not seeing it. Perhaps you could, Ray? In the chat, okay. But the question is, can you please provide more information on the meeting of a hazard quotient exceeding one on slide 22? Sure, I can, I can answer that. So generally uh, what a hazard quotient means is that it's an estimate of an exposure uh, relative to some reference dose or reference concentration. And so generally a, 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 that's a ratio and a hazard quotient greater than one just means that the exposure might exceed that. Uh, specific to that slide, just to explain a little bit more what the committee did to run a screening level assessment, we applied EPA's regional screening level approach. Uh, and so there's a series of equations that takes into account the various pathways that Dr. Pachowski uh, laid out, so soil ingestion, dermal exposure, inhalation. And we looked at um, concentrations that are uh, reported in some of the risk assessments. So those are uh, summary statistics, sort of average concentrations that have been measured at various areas. And that gives us some idea of sort of the relative magnitude of concentrations of some of these metals. So again, what, what we did was to use those estimates that uh, kind of represent an average, and we applied standard um, uh, equations that EPA uses to estimate exposure. And then we related that to the established toxicity values uh, for these compounds. And um, by applying the same process to each compound, uh, it allows us to have some relative ranking. And so that's the basis for the grouping is um, sort of applying the same screening approach, uh, chemical specific toxicity values and estimates of average concentrations measured in soil that has been um, amended in some way uh, with the unencapsulated slag. So I, I think the final thing I'll say is an ex these, this is a screening level assessment. And so an exceedance of a screening level in and of itself um, doesn't mean that there's necessarily a risk. And again, our effort here wasn't a, a risk assessment per se. It was a relative ranking um, as a hazard sort of ranking approach. And what, what, what we were really trying to do is um, uh, take the composition information and come up with some way of sort of rank ordering the importance of the compounds. And what we see is, for example, manganese and hexavalent chromium rank higher. They're in that group that could potentially exceed a hazard quotient of one. Maybe I'll stop there, Ray, uh, unless there's a follow-up. Sounds good. <clears throat> I see also in the questions uh, from Renee Guy, um, and this to you, Ray, um, will you be sending out the presentation or I guess how is, does the public have access to this public uh, to this uh, presentation? Well, the presentation will uh, be part of the video recording that will be available after a day or so after today. And there'll be a link provided on the event web page. All right, thank you. And from uh, Tara Hubner, um, this one uh, I think will go back to uh, Dr. Goodrum, but um, the committee recommends that the site-specific exposure factor values as opposed to literature or guidance document-based values be used when assessing risk from residential applications of uh, EAF slag. 
what approaches are available to develop site-specific incidental uh, ingestion rates of uh, slag fine particles. And I'll first say that I think that what we meant by site-specific is um, trying to evaluate what exposures might be expected from the different uh, plants overall. But uh, Phil, you want to uh, answer the second part of that for uh, incidental ingestion rates? Sure. Uh, by and large, when site-specific risk assessments are done, the, um, you know, the question is about the soil and dust ingestion rates specifically. And um, uh, we do have estimates of those for young children as well as adults. Um, typically, um, that particular exposure factor, which is in an exposure assessment, uh, is based on a recommended guidance value. Uh, and those guidance values are derived from uh, the literature and um, uh, most recently some publications that um, uh, look at or rely upon really extensive data sets where we have measurements in environmental media and then we have internal measurements of blood lead. So uh, there's been a, a recent use of um, lead exposure modeling to help inform uh, the soil and dust ingestion rate. Um, but again, uh, uh, largely at site risk assessments, site-specific risk assessments, um, we don't have uh, a study conducted specifically of contact rates and soil and dust ingestion rates, and instead we rely on recommended guidance values from uh, the U.S. EPA. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> Thomas Simmons, um, asked, um, can we speak uh, more about the particle size distribution? Uh, for instance, did you see in your research that EAF readily, readily breaks down uh, and uh, that there's significant small particles? I don't believe that there's been adequate um, research in this area, but I'll defer to uh, Dr. O'Day if she's still on um, regarding the exposures. Uh, yeah, ac actually, if uh, Dr. Bain is on, I think he's the one that actually looked at the particle size distribution. So if he's on, he's probably better positioned to answer. Okay, yeah, sorry. Sure, sure. sure. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we can't speak more because that is one of the glaring gaps in, in the information. We just, there's, and some, you know, there's, Limited data, the data that is there, there's quite a bit of variability in breakdown rates. And, you know, then the the focus is on breakdown in terms of aggregates. So the really fine particles, there's, there's extremely small amounts of data to evaluate that. So we really can't say much more than what we said in the report. Um, from A. Gibson, uh, what is the risk uh, to environment if the slag is laying in a river? Um, and I'm afraid that that's kind of outside of our purview, as that wouldn't be a residential uh, use. Um, and I'm not sure whether there's uh, that much information on that. I would in, su suggest that if it was under water that's flowing and it's good in aerobic water that um, you'd have a limited amount of chromium exposure, but um, I don't think that there's any uh, real data there. Uh, follow up from uh, Thomas Simmons. Um, and further, did you see any difference in metals concentrations at different particle sizes? I'll, I'll just echo what uh, Dr. Bain said, and I don't think that there is adequate uh, information out there uh, on that. Uh, you might, uh, again, Phil, Phil might have a, a comment on that as well. Okay. Well, no. No, I think that's right. We don't have a lot of data on the enrichment factor, unfortunately. Um, 
so I couldn't add much more, Ray. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Again, there are a lot of data gaps. Um, Thomas Simmons, uh, I just lost it. Um, I, I just saw one from um, Thomas Simmons again, but um, thank you. We just answered that one. Okay, I, I think he had a follow up, but um, yeah, we did. We did. So, um, Tara Hubner, um, did you review and include in your assessment the leaf method leach uh, testing and also particle size analysis on both fresh and weathered slag? Uh, that the EPA and Vanderbilt University perform. Uh, yes, we we the leaf was presented to us, uh, and uh, we uh, definitely considered it. I guess this one for Dr. O'Day. Yeah, that that's right. But um, I think one of the difficulties here was that we got um, a preliminary or presentation of the preliminary results. And the committee was never provided with the final results from the Vanderbilt group because uh, they had not issued their report. So we saw some preliminary data, but we did not include that data in our report because we, we didn't have the final version of the data. The preliminary data was consistent with other leaf testing showing that um, at alkaline conditions that you don't generally mobilize metals, but um, we we didn't have the full set of data, so we couldn't evaluate everything. And Dr. Day, I think um, that's where my comments about alkaline water, uh, et cetera, um, came from. Right. Correct. Yeah. 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 So I don't see any open questions. Ray, it looks like there's no more um, questions in the queue. That's uh, correct. We're close to the end of our hour. Should we wrap it up or? Yeah, I think uh, I think we're um, we're at the end. Um, since there are no more questions, I think we can um, tell uh, send our thanks to to the. Uh, interest people um, showed in, in hearing about the report. And um, we um, hope the video recording will be available soon. We'll make sure it uh, gets up expeditiously so folks have access to it. And uh, remember the full report is available for free, uh, downloading for free from our uh, Academy's website. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank the committee members, uh, academy staff, and all the uh, folks who uh, listened in on the um, live stream.